Welcome to the Trip Hacks DC podcast. Discover the best tips, tricks, and travel hacks for your visit to the nation's capital. And now, here's Rob. Hello, and thank you for tuning in. If you want to check out any show notes from this episode, listen to other episodes, or learn about Trip Hacks DC guided tours, you can do all of that over at TripHacksDC.com. If you're new to this podcast or Trip Hacks DC in general, hello, my name is Rob. I'm a tour guide, and I founded Trip Hacks DC back in 2017. My goal is to give you my best tips, tricks, and travel hacks so you can have the best possible trip when you visit Washington, DC. It's the 1st of March, which means we've made it through the winter trenches. Well, technically, we still have a few more weeks to go officially, but March is always when we transition from winter into spring. And spring is an extremely popular time of year in DC. And the reason can be summed up with two words, cherry blossoms. Seeing the Washington, D.C. cherry blossoms in peak bloom is truly a bucket list experience. And every year, I have to remind myself how lucky I am that I get to do it. And because I know lots of other people want to experience it, I wanted to compile all of my years of experience into a single guide, which is this podcast episode. I'm going to round up and share everything I personally know about the cherry blossoms. This is certainly not the only cherry blossom content I've made. Two years ago, I interviewed the president of the National Cherry Blossom Festival in podcast episode number 35, so I recommend checking that out to get the perspective of an event organizer. I've also done a lot of cherry blossom videos on the Trip DC YouTube channel, including, for the past several years, video walking tours around the Tidal Basin. I'll link to both that podcast episode and a YouTube playlist with all the Cherry Blossom videos in the show notes for this episode. Now, before we get into the details about the actual Cherry Blossoms, I feel it's helpful context to have some background on the history of the Cherry Blossoms and the National Cherry Blossom Festival. Because the Cherry Blossoms that you see in D.C. and nowadays all over the United States are native to Japan and they've only been in this country for a relatively short time. The first cherry trees arrived in the United States from Japan in 1910. But these trees never got planted, because when they arrived on U.S. soil, they were discovered to be diseased and infested with insects and ordered to be destroyed. We're lucky because in an alternative reality, that would have been the end of the experiment. But we tried again, and the cherry blossoms that arrived from Japan in 1912 were in good health and ultimately planted in Washington, D.C. Now, when it comes to the history of the cherry blossoms, you'll often hear two names of people who are responsible for bringing them to the United States. Dr. David Fairchild, a scientist at the U.S. Agriculture Department who planted some Japanese cherry trees near his home to prove they could survive the D.C. climate, and Helen Taft, the first lady to President William Howard Taft. However, back in episode 40 of this podcast, I interviewed the authors of the book 111 Places in Women's History in Washington, D.C. that you must not miss. When I read the book, I learned that a third person, perhaps the most important person in this story of the cherry blossoms, is frequently omitted from these stories. That person is a woman named Eliza Skidmore. Eliza Skidmore was a world traveler, and her brother was a diplomat. So she got to see lots of different parts of the world, including Japan in the 1800s, when most Americans had no idea what that part of the world was like. Eliza Skidmore tried for over 20 years to convince anyone in a position of authority that the United States should import these beautiful cherry trees. But unfortunately, no one took her seriously. When I read about Eliza Skidmore, she kind of reminded me of Emily Blunt's character in the new Jungle Cruise Disney movie. Basically, a woman who is extremely smart, extremely accomplished, but can't get anyone to take her seriously because she lives in a period of history when people in power don't take women seriously. The whole thing is a combination of sad and infuriating, and fortunately, she finally caught a break in 1909 when she wrote a letter to First Lady Helen Taft about the cherry blossoms, and the First Lady took an interest. 
Helen Taft had been to Japan, so she knew about the cherry trees, and she had something important that Eliza Skidmore didn't. Helen Taft had connections and political muscle. The First Lady may not have a lot of official power, but a project like this is exactly what they can do. This is all to say that obviously both women played a part in bringing the cherry trees to DC. But generally speaking, Helen Taft probably gets too much credit, and Eliza Skidmore too little credit. There is no statue of Eliza Skidmore on the title basin. No plaque, no nothing. Maybe that will change in the future, but at least in 2024, that's the state of things. Now, many people date the very first Cherry Blossom Festival to March 27th, 1912, when Helen Taft and the Vicountess Chinda, wife of the Japanese ambassador, planted two Yoshino cherry trees on the northern side of the tidal basin. At that event, the First Lady presented a bouquet of American roses to Vicountess Chinda. In the 1930s, the Cherry Blossom Festival was officially recognized as a special three-day celebration in D.C. After World War II, it was lengthened to a week. And in the 1990s, it was lengthened again to two weeks. The current version of the National Cherry Blossom Festival is over three weeks long, always starting on March 20th, the first day of spring. Even though Washington, D.C. was the first place in the U.S. to receive Yoshino cherry trees from Japan, it is not the only place where you can see them now. Cherry trees are amazing, and you can find them more or less everywhere now, coast to coast and in between. A similarly named, but not affiliated festival, is called the International Cherry Blossom Festival, and that's in Macon, Georgia. In terms of raw numbers, Macon has more cherry trees than D.C. Last year, during our Cherry Blossom Festival, the state of New Jersey was advertising all of the places in their state where you can visit to see even more concentrations of cherry blossoms for anyone who's really into it. I would love to know if that advertising campaign enticed anyone to go to New Jersey, but my point is that the cherry trees are just about everywhere. Now, Let's clarify that the National Cherry Blossom Festival is both the actual festival that occurs every March and April and the 501c3 nonprofit organization that is responsible for organizing and executing the event. So when I said before that I interviewed the president of the National Cherry Blossom Festival, technically I interviewed the CEO of that nonprofit organization. Let's talk about dates. Every year, the National Cherry Blossom Festival starts on March 20th, the first day of spring. But it ends on a different date every year. This year, 2024, that ending date is April 14th. Basically, the start date is always the same, no matter what day of the week. But the end date is usually on a Sunday, so that the festival ends at the end of the weekend. This year's festival is 25 days long, or three weeks and four days. But in any given year in the future, it might be a slightly different number. Those festival dates are when you will find official festival programming. They are not, necessarily, when you will see cherry blossoms in peak bloom, or in any bloom. I just want to make sure I make this point crystal clear. Festival dates are not the same as bloom dates. And just because you are in D.C. during the festival dates does not guarantee you will get to see peak bloom. Since we're on this topic, let's talk about peak bloom. Peak bloom is defined as the day when 70% of the Yoshino cherry blossoms are open. Peak bloom is amazing. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. But it is notoriously difficult to time. When it comes to peak bloom, the advice I give is don't expect to see it but be pleasantly surprised if you get lucky and are able to experience it. I just did an entire podcast episode about expectations management, and expectations about the cherry blossoms can get out of whack really easily. The cherry blossoms go through six phases before they open. Phase one is when buds start to appear on the trees, and stage six is when they are open or blossomed. 
How quickly phases two through five happen depends heavily on the weather and the temperature. Let me give you an example using bread baking as an analogy. It's not a perfect analogy, but I like to make bread, so it's helpful for me and hopefully will be for you too. Imagine you're making your rustic homemade bread. You mix up your flour and your water and your yeast and your salt, and then you divide your dough into three pieces to rise. The first piece you put immediately into the refrigerator. The second piece you put in a cool part of your house. And the third piece you put in a warm part of your house. What's going to happen? The piece in the warm spot will rise quickly. The piece in the cool spot will rise more slowly. And the piece in the fridge will rise very slowly. That's essentially what's happening with the cherry blossoms. If the air in Washington, D.C. is refrigerator temperature in early and mid-March, the phases will progress slowly and will have a late bloom. If the air is warm, then the phases progress quickly and we have an early bloom. And the key thing is, it doesn't have to be warm the entire time. Even a few days of warmth in early March can really speed up the blossoming and lead to an early bloom. One thing that happens every year that I think is kind of annoying is that there is a big press event, usually on March 1st. Though this year I saw it's going to be on February 29th, which is a couple days after I'm recording this. On that day, meteorologists from the National Park Service make their prediction for peak bloom. The reason why I find this annoying is because if you go to the Bloom Watch website on nps.gov, it says, and I'm quoting directly now, Forecasting peak bloom is almost impossible more than 10 days in advance. 10 days in advance is bolded on the website for emphasis. Also, they use the word impossible. So basically, they're going to put out a prediction for probably a date three or more weeks out, then right underneath say, eh, just kidding, predictions more than 10 days out are nearly impossible. The reason I find this problematic is because, again, it's all about expectations management. If you put out a prediction and people don't understand that it's an unreliable prediction, and let's face it, most news organizations do not report this properly, then people may create expectations for what they're going to experience when they come to DC that may not pan out. And even after saying all of this, there are still people out there who will contact me and say, but Rob, when do you think peak bloom will be this year? And before I answer that, I want to read you the historical data of peak bloom from the past decade. Ready? Here we go. March 23rd, March 21st, March 28th, March 28th again, April 1st, April 5th, March 25th, March 25th, April 10th, April 10th, April 9th. That is a huge range of dates and an almost three week difference between the earliest bloom and the latest bloom. Of course, this is just historical data, and as they say in finance, past performance is no indication of future profitability. If I could pick stocks based on simply which ones did the best historically, I'd be rich and not in this line of work. But it doesn't work that way. One thing I will say is, I think we are pretty clearly in a new reality because of climate change. The Earth is different now than it was even a decade ago. If I were a gambler, I feel like the safer bet is to bet on an early bloom rather than a late one. Of course, just betting on something does not guarantee that outcome. So my advice from before is still the same. Don't expect to see peak bloom, but be pleasantly surprised if you get lucky and you do. Let's dig a bit deeper now on the actual National Cherry Blossom Festival. The official festival does a ton of great programming, and I typically think it breaks up into three categories. The first is signature events, which are the big events that draw big crowds. The second are the smaller events, which are still quite cool even if they're less well known and less attended. And the third is multi-week programming, which doesn't necessarily happen on a specific date, but usually it's ongoing during the entire multi-week festival. I talked with the president of the Cherry Blossom Festival about a lot of the signature events, so I highly recommend going back to episode 35 if you want to hear her perspective on them. In case you haven't heard it, I'm going to breeze through them right now. 
First, we have the opening ceremony, which is a free stage play to celebrate the beginning of spring and the festival. It features performers and artists from both the U.S. and Japan. Then we have the Pink Tie Party, which is another sort of kickoff party, except this one is not free. Pink Tie is a play on Black Tie, and it's a fancy party with expensive tickets. It's a fundraiser. It's a way for the festival to raise money to put on a lot of the free events. I've never personally gone to the Pink Tie Party, but if you have some cash and you really want to spend it, you can definitely spend it here. Next, we have the Blossom Kite Festival, which is held at the Washington Monument. It has activities, music, competitions, and performances themed around kite flying. Next is the National Cherry Blossom Parade, which is a celebration of spring with balloons, floats, marching bands, and celebrity entertainers. It's personally my favorite parade that we have in D.C. Then we have Petal Palooza, which is a big neighborhood festival celebrating spring and the cherry blossoms. This was previously called the Southwest Neighborhood Festival because the Tidal Basin is in the southwest quadrant of D.C. They moved it to a bigger space at the Yards Park, and since that space is no longer technically in the southwest quadrant, they rebranded it to Petal Palooza. Sakura Matsuri is a Japanese street festival held near the U.S. Capitol. That's a festival of Japanese food, culture, and art. There are two race events usually held back-to-back on a Saturday and Sunday. First is the Cherry Blossom 5K, which is a modest course on Pennsylvania Avenue between the White House and Capitol. Then the next day on Sunday is the Cherry Blossom 10-mile race, which is near the Tidal Basin and East Potomac Park. So those are the signature events that you can count on just about every year. But like I said, there are also smaller events as well. You can find info about all of these on the official website, nationalcherryblossomfestival.org. They have a filter where you can select a range of dates, and it will tell you everything that's happening during that period. So it's extremely handy for visitors because you can just plug in your trip dates and see what's available. A few things for 2024 I found when I was looking the other day include a live art projection by artist Robin Bell at the National Portrait Gallery, a Japanese Culture Day at the Library of Congress, and a Japanese afternoon tea at the University Club in D.C. It's also worth saying that signature events are usually announced months in advance, but smaller events are added to the calendar fairly late. So even if you go on the website now, March 1st, and don't find any small events that fit your schedule, keep checking back because new things get added closer to the festival. The third category I mentioned is multi-week programming. Some of these started in 2020 when the festival was canceled due to COVID, but they were popular enough that the organizers decided to keep them around. An example of this is Petal Porches, where locals here in D.C. can deck out their homes in pink decorations, and then a committee of judges goes around and decides who has the best petal porch. Another one of these is called Art in Bloom, where artists decorate these giant metal flowers that are scattered all around the D.C. area. You can either treat it as a cool art exhibit as you stumble upon them, or you can play a scavenger hunt and try to find them all. One other thing I'm really not sure how to categorize, but I want to mention because it's pretty cool, is the Tidal Basin Welcome Area and Main Stage. This is located right on the Tidal Basin between the FDR and MLK memorials. There is a huge diversity of performances. It has music, dance, jump rope, all kinds of entertainment. And within that, there's all kinds of styles, from pop to jazz to R&B, just about everything. There's also food trucks and a beer garden, though to set the correct expectations, it's more like picnic tables on the street with some drinks. They try to time it so that the main stage is active during the week of peak bloom, which, as previously discussed, is notoriously hard to time. So sometimes the timing works perfectly, and sometimes it misses the actual peak bloom. But the reason they don't actually post dates for performances until closer to the festival is so that they can try to line them up. Wow, we've already talked about a ton, and I still have a huge list of things to cover. So let's take a one-minute break so I can go pour another cup of coffee, and then we'll talk about planning a spring trip, logistics, overall tips, and more.
If you're listening to this podcast, my hunch is that you're probably planning an upcoming trip to Washington, D.C., or at least dreaming about a future adventure. One thing I've learned from meeting thousands of travelers and doing a bit of traveling myself over the years is that experiences are usually the best memories from a trip. That's why I started Trip Hacks DC. I didn't just want to create content to help you plan a trip, but also to provide an amazing experience once you arrive. And I think it's worked because people tell me all the time that their Trip Hacks DC tour was the highlight of their trip, and that really makes me happy. So if that's something that sounds up your alley, you can head over to TripHacksDC.com to learn about taking a private tour with me or a public group tour with one of the amazing Trip Hacks DC tour guides. And we're back. Now let's talk about the best time to visit during cherry blossom season. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Cherry blossom season is the single busiest period of the entire year for tourism in D.C. It's going to be crowded when you come. But it's going to be even more crowded if you come during one of the two weeks when seemingly every school is on spring break. I completely understand that for some people, they don't really have flexibility when it comes to travel. If your kids are on spring break during specific dates, then that's when you can travel. If you do have flexibility, I might suggest trying to figure out what the spring break weeks are going to be in a given year and then pick maybe the week before or maybe the week after. For example, this year, in 2024, the last week of March and the first week in April are very clearly spring break weeks for most schools. But if you can come, say, the third week in March or the second week in April, you'll still be here during the Cherry Blossom Festival and maybe even have a little bit more breathing room. This year, Easter Sunday is on March 31st. And while I don't think Easter matters per se, as it's not a government holiday, I have come to learn that some religious schools anchor their spring break to Easter. So an earlier Easter means that there's an earlier spring break and vice versa. Non-religious schools typically try to keep a consistent spring break week, which might be like the first week in April every year. What I'm saying is you have to do a little bit of detective work because every year things are going to be a little bit different. Ultimately, though, you will drive yourself crazy trying to optimize the absolute best dates. So if you can find dates during the Cherry Blossom Festival that work for your family, I would just go for it. Now, let's talk about hotels and accommodation, because that's going to be one of, if not, the biggest expenses on your trip. I'm just going to say off the bat, hotel rates during the Cherry Blossom season are going to be high. I've always said that hotel rates in D.C. are based on the combination of demand for business travel and tourism. Unfortunately, spring tends to have both. Unlike, say, the 4th of July, where there's demand for tourism but really none for business travel, cherry blossom season has high demand for tourism and high demand for business and conference travel. There are plenty of corporate-type events happening in D.C. in the spring. If you haven't heard it before, I highly recommend listening to episode 37 of this podcast where I walk through in great detail all of the areas that I recommend staying. I always think location is a top consideration when choosing a hotel, and I think it's doubly important during cherry blossom season. Ideally, you want to be within walking distance of as much as possible. If you can swing a hotel in a location where you can walk places, perfect. If not, The next best option is to choose a hotel close to Metro, as that is the second best way to get around. Actually, let's use that as an opportunity to transition into transportation logistics. During cherry blossom season, the best way to get around is on foot. The second best way to get around is on Metro. After that, every other transportation mode is dicey. But the absolute worst way of trying to get around is driving your own car. I personally feel Cherry Blossom Festival organizers and local officials are far too weak on this point, so let me state it as clearly as possible. Do not drive a car anywhere near the Tidal Basin when cherry blossoms are in bloom. I repeat, do not drive a car anywhere near the Tidal Basin when cherry blossoms are in bloom. I'm not mincing my words here because this is something I believe very strongly. In general, 
tourists have no business driving in D.C. But especially during cherry blossom season, it's going to be a bad time. I'm going to link to a Washingtonian Magazine article in the show notes. This article from last year, March 27th, 2023, is titled, Cherry Blossom Dreams Turned Into a Traffic Nightmare Over the Weekend. There are some incredible photos and videos in the article. People were stuck in East Potomac Park in bumper-to-bumper traffic for hours. People were abandoning their cars on the interstate bridge over the Washington Channel because there was literally nowhere near the tidal basin to park. It was an absolute mess and one that I would hope local officials would learn from, but I don't trust that they will. So I feel like it's on me to say it. Don't drive. Don't drive. Don't drive. The thing is, I was actually out on the National Mall in Tidal Basin on the weekend that that article was written about. And because I know driving is a fool's errand and I don't do it, I made it out basically unscathed. So please, do yourself a favor and don't drive. Now, what about some of the other transportation options that we have in D.C.? Like taxi, Uber, Circulator Bus, Capital Bike Share, any vehicle that goes in regular traffic, and that includes a taxi, an Uber, or the Circulator Bus, will be slow and potentially unreliable during the bloom. In fact, on some dates during peak bloom, the Circulator Bus doesn't even go on its regular route around the Tidal Basin. I personally think this is a shame, and if I were in charge of things, traffic would be handled a lot differently. But until I am, unfortunately, while these modes are not as bad as driving yourself, they are also potentially slower and more frustrating than just going on foot. Capital Bike Share is a bit trickier. During peak bloom dates in the past, Capital Bike Share has done what's called a bike corral, which is a special area where you can drop off a bike and not have to worry about finding an open station. These are usually staffed by someone from Capital Bike Share who checks the bikes in and out. However, they typically only do this on the busiest weekend days. So on other days, you really need to be mindful that if you ride a bike down to the Tidal Basin, that there's going to be a dock open where you can end your ride. The Capital Bike Share app is a must-have if you're going to attempt this. Speaking of crowds, let's talk about when crowds are the heaviest and strategies to avoid them. Generally speaking, the heaviest crowds in the Tidal Basin will be on the Saturday and Sunday of Peak Bloom. On these dates, the Tidal Basin will be absolutely mobbed. In general, you will find heavier crowds on the weekends than on weekdays. And there are two reasons for this. The first is that the signature events are scheduled on the weekends. And the second is that the weekends are when a lot of locals from the suburbs try to come in and see the blossoms. Remember that the Washington, D.C. metro area has a population over 5 million, which is larger than some entire countries. Within a given day, you will generally find the heaviest crowds between about 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. If you really want to see the blossoms in daylight, sunrise tends to have slightly lighter crowds. Remember that the lightest crowds doesn't mean no crowds. There's still going to be plenty of people out. Sunrise is when most photographers come out either to try to capture the blossoms as a landscape or to do portraits with clients. You will see a lot of photographers and a lot of cameras out first thing in the morning. You will also find much lighter crowds on the Tidal Basin after dark. Sunset in D.C. on April 1st is around 7.30 p.m., and it will pretty much be dark by 8 o'clock. Now, I will admit that the blossoms do tend to photograph much better in the daylight. But if you don't care about photos and you just want to see them and experience them, coming after dark is a good way to avoid the heavy crowds. But what about safety? People ask me frequently about whether it's safe to be out after dark. I recorded an entire podcast episode number 45 on the question of safety, and I highly recommend listening to that if you're worried about this. But I personally have no qualms about being out around the Tidal Basin after dark. Parts of the park are kind of dark, yes, but during the bloom, there are typically plenty of other people out and about, so it doesn't feel like you're alone in the dark in the park. On the topic of safety, the biggest threat to your safety during the bloom is drivers. I hate that it's like this, but you really do need to be careful around traffic. I have never, ever seen the amount of road rage that people get when they're stuck in traffic during peak bloom. 
I've seen people do some truly unhinged things in cars when they get frustrated, and I'd hate for any innocent bystander to get hurt as a result. So again, don't drive, and be careful of those who didn't listen to my advice and drove anyway. Now, that's the Tidal Basin, undoubtedly the most famous spot in D.C. to see cherry blossoms, and one of the largest concentrations of cherry blossoms. But there are lots of other viewing spots. If you ask a local their favorite place to see cherry blossoms, they might tell you that it's the street corner near their house. Cherry blossoms are planted all over the city, and what's great is that you will find them all over as you explore. My personal favorite place to see cherry blossoms is East Potomac Park. This is a giant park adjacent to the Tidal Basin. Even though it's right there, it's often much less crowded than the basin itself. It's also one of my favorite bike rides in D.C. Sometimes you will hear this area called Haynes Point. Technically, Haynes Point is the southernmost part of the park, the literal point. To do the full loop, if you start and end at the Jefferson Memorial, is about four miles. So it's totally doable on foot if you're physically up for it. I personally like to do it on a bike, but I know not everyone's comfortable on a bike. In any case, you have options. Another pretty famous spot to see cherry blossoms is on the grounds of the Washington Monument. A lot of early bloomers are located here, so if you come a bit before peak bloom, you can often find some nice-looking blossoms near the monument. Another spot that I like is Stanton Park, which is a small park a few blocks east of the Capitol building. This one definitely feels a lot more like a local spot, whereas the Washington Monument feels more like a tourist spot. There is a huge concentration of beautiful cherry trees in both places. Another spot that's a few miles away from a lot of tourist sites and therefore not usually too crowded is the National Arboretum. The Arboretum is essentially a large outdoor museum of trees. So of course they're going to have some very nice cherry trees as well as other flowering trees on the grounds. They also have the National Bonsai Museum, which is very cool. Like I said, there are lots of places in D.C. where you can see cherry blossoms, from the National Mall, to the neighborhoods, to the suburbs. Definitely go down to the Tidal Basin and experience that. But otherwise, just enjoy the blossoms as you stumble upon them. Now, let's talk about dining and shopping during the festival. The National Mall has always been a bit of a restaurant desert. There are food trucks that set up near the major sites. They are convenient, but I personally never eat at them. Take that information and draw your own conclusions from it. One exception I will say is the food trucks set up in the official Tidal Basin welcome area are usually legit and part of the official programming, not just a random truck pulled up on the side of the road. So I might eat at one of those if I was really hungry and the line wasn't too long. Otherwise, it's best to have a plan to eat away from the National Mall and Tidal Basin. If you're staying north of the mall, scope out the restaurant options near your hotel. If you're staying south, there are plenty of places to eat at the wharf. Just be aware that the wharf gets quite crowded during cherry blossom season, as it's fairly close to the basin. A lot of restaurants usually do cherry blossom themed food and drinks. To be honest, I think a lot of these wind up just being regular items with pink food coloring, but some of them are creative and interesting. Washingtonian Magazine is a good source for food and restaurant-related happenings, and I'm sure they will have a roundup of cherry blossom-themed items closer to the date. As far as shopping, there are no shortage of pink-colored and cherry blossom-themed things that you can buy. The Tidal Basin Welcome Area has a shop. The signature events like Petalpalooza and the Kite Festival will have shops. A lot of museum gift stores will sell cherry blossom themed things. If you want a cherry blossom themed souvenir to take home, you can find one. All right, I know I've covered a lot, but I want to make sure this episode is comprehensive. So I actually went through the comments on the YouTube channel on the cherry blossom related videos, and I tried to round up any additional questions that people have asked that I haven't already addressed. So here we go. Is the National Cherry Blossom Festival kid-friendly slash stroller-friendly? The short answer is yes. My caveat is that it can be pretty overwhelming, and kids tend to run out of energy faster than adults. So this is a matter of knowing your kids and how much stimulation they can handle. Obviously, kid-friendly is a broad term, and as I covered in podcast episode 48 about visiting D.C. with kids— 
the age of the kids makes a huge difference. As far as stroller friendly, again, in theory, the National Mall and Tidal Basin is stroller friendly, but crowds can get so large during the bloom that it can be challenging to navigate a stroller. I wouldn't say not to bring one if you need one, but pack some extra patience for getting it around. The next question is, is the Cherry Blossom Festival dog friendly? This is another one where the short answer is yes, and the longer answer is, it depends. The National Cherry Blossom Festival is officially dog friendly, and they even have some pet care companies as corporate sponsors. But just like with kids, you need to know your own dog and how well they do in crowds. Some dogs love it. Other dogs have high anxiety and the cherry blossom would be a miserable time for them. Personally, I will say that I tried to bring my own dog out to the Blossom Kite Festival last year and it was a bad choice in hindsight because the crowds were huge and it just wasn't comfortable for him. But for just going for a walk around the Tidal Basin, he would be fine. So the unsatisfying answer is, it depends. The next question is, is the Cherry Blossom Festival wheelchair friendly? Again, the short answer is yes. But the longer answer is, because of the large crowds, it can be harder to navigate than at other times of the year. I know the National Cherry Blossom Festival, as an organization, tries hard to be accessible and inclusive. But there are just some realities about having an outdoor event like this in a crowded space. And the last question is, this is a big one, is it worth it? I personally think it is absolutely worth coming to D.C. during the cherry blossom season at least once, if you can swing it. Like I said before, I am extremely lucky that I am able to experience the bloom every single year. Now, if I didn't live here, I don't know I would necessarily want to come every single year. As a traveler, I personally prefer to visit places during the low season when things are a bit more chill, but there are some things in life that if you want to experience them, you just have to go for it. I consider cherry blossoms in D.C. to be one of them. So that's my comprehensive guide to everything I know about the cherry blossom season in D.C. I hope it was helpful if you're planning a trip to come see them, or that this episode helped you decide if you want to come and see them. But the episode isn't over yet. Stick around for my monthly update about what's new and happening here in D.C. <laughs> All right, now if you missed last month's episode, I've decided to introduce this segment at the end of every episode, where I give a quick update about what's going on in the city and with Trip Hacks DC. This segment is at the end of the episode as a little reward for all the super fans who are engaged enough to listen all the way through. I'm still working on a name for this segment and for you, the super fans who are listening, so stay tuned for that. I want to start with an update on Trip Hacks DC tours. Tours got off to a pretty slow start this year. Tour bookings were down quite a bit in January and February compared to January and February of 2023. I'm not too worried about it though. I feel like 2023 was the outlier and this year is more or less back to normal seasonality. Tourism in DC is seasonal and January and February are historically the two slowest months. Looking ahead to March, Tours are booking up, so that's good news, for me at least. At the time I'm recording this, almost every tour is booked the last week in March and the first week in April, and I do already have some people on the waiting list. Those are the weeks I believe most kids are on school spring break, and DC is going to be mobbed those two weeks. I can confidently say that right now. So if you're coming during one of those two weeks, or actually I would say if you're coming in March or April at all, finalize your arrangements as soon as possible. Get your bookings and your reservations made. Get tickets for anything that requires tickets, whether it's a free ticket or a paid ticket. I'm afraid if you haven't done that yet, it might already be too late for some things. And nothing pains me more than when people don't get to do what they wanted to do because they waited too long and everything was booked up by the time they got to it. Another update I want to give is on the Trip Hacks DC semi-private tour. I announced this at the end of last month's podcast episode. This is a ticket-based tour with me as the guide. I'm capping it at 10 tickets per tour. 
The idea is that it's a more accessible option for smaller groups than a private tour. I'm testing it this spring, and depending on how well it sells, I may extend it into the summer. It's on the calendar for four dates. March 23rd, March 30th, April 6th, and April 13th. I initially said I would consider it a success if I sell 24 or more tickets. I'm not there yet, but there's still several weeks before the first date, so it is possible. My overall feeling is that there is not nearly the same demand for this tour as my private tours. But I really want this to work because I want my tours to be accessible as possible. And a lot of times people tell me that they just can't swing a private tour because it's cost prohibitive, especially if it's just a single traveler or a couple. And this is true, that since it's a flat price, the bigger your group or your family, the better the value proposition. So anyway, hopefully when I record this segment for next month's podcast episode, I'll have an update about whether the semi-private tour experiment turned out to be a success or not. In the meantime, private tours and the monumental trivia tour with Christine are both open for bookings through the end of May. March and April are booking up quickly, but May still has a lot of availability. May is always kind of a weird month, kind of like an in-between month, when it feels busy in D.C. because there are so many field trip groups, but there aren't really a ton of families. Usually, the family travelers are waiting till summer break to make their trip. Personally, I'm glad it's March. January and February can feel like a bit of a slog, between the gray weather and the post-holiday hangover. But spring in D.C. is really quite special, even if a bit exhausting. So I'm definitely looking forward to it. And with that, I hope you enjoyed the episode and the new end of episode still to be named segment. I referenced a lot of other episodes in this one, so I will have direct links to those in the show notes if you want to check them out. And if you want to leave a rating for this podcast in your favorite podcast app, that's always appreciated. And if you're interested in a Trip Hacks DC tour, head on over to the website and check it out. Thanks for listening to the Trip Hacks DC podcast. To see the show notes from today's episode, get additional resources for planning your trip, or to book a Trip Hacks DC guided tour, visit triphacksdc.com.